Well, welcome. On behalf of the uh, family, I think I'm on. It just everyone is. Hello? Can you hear me? No? Well, how about that? A little louder, they say. I can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me now? Remember that commercial? Well, two things, real before we get started. The family would, is just so grateful for all of your attendance here to remember Alma and the legacy of her life and to uh, show your love and affection for all the family members. It's a big family. It's a well-connected family, and it's an exemplary family as well. Also, we'd like to thank Saitsuma because we didn't think that you would have so many people here, and we told them we'd have maybe 60 or so, and, and they've been scrambling and doing an awesome job getting all these chairs out here for you, so thank you to the Saitsuma Funeral Home. I have to be honest, when I have to do a funeral, if I have a choice, it's always Saitsuma, and they did not ask me to say that. This is not, this is not a commercial for them, but I have always enjoyed how well they take care of those who are hurting in this time of their need. Well, we're gathered here this morning to celebrate and remember the life and legacy of Alma B. Fox. By the way, this will be broadcast, and I want to just have a shout out to Blair and Kim Anderson from New Zealand, who will be watching this. We miss you. Wish you could be here. Alma was born on March 11, 1925 in Muskegon to Albert and Augusta Hendrickson. It was a different world then, a world that was reeling from World War I and the aftermath of it. And this is what happened, just a few of the events that happened in 1925. On January 3rd, Benito Mussolini announces that he's going to take over uh, the dictatorial powers of Italy. On the 21st of March in that year, something called the Butler Act was passed in Tennessee, which is a law that was prohibiting the teaching of evolution in the public schools. On the 21st of April, the Manifesto of the Fascist Intellectuals is published uh, for, uh, establishing the political and ideological foundations of the Italian fascism that was in the world. On the 10th of July, the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee took place. Do you remember what the Scopes trial, what your history books tells you? Well, that was a trial about, te about teaching evolution. John T. Scopes was a young high school science teacher and he was teaching evolution in the schools. On July 18th, Adolf Hitler published his uh, manifesto called Mein Kampf. In July of that same year, the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee was decided, and he was found guilty and fined $100 for teaching evolution. And on the 3rd of December, the World War I aftermath was finally finished, or continued really. The Locarno Treaty was signed, and that established the territorial uh, areas, settlements after the war, which was a great cause of anger and depression and unsettling really around the world. It didn't really accomplish anything. Now I say that to give you a picture of what the world was like that Alma came into. And looking back, we can see these developments were not a very good thing. She was born into a world that was turning dark. They were volatile times. They would be times of unprecedented death and destruction in just a few years. Alma and her family would weather the Great Depression from 1929 to 1939, and they would endure all of the stuff that happened in World War II. And in the providence of God, however, she was born into a strong and stable family, one which she was grateful and strongly connected to. She had three sisters and three brothers. On January 5th, 1943, Alma married her lifelong love, Jerry, Jerry Fox. Larry. I'm sorry, Larry. <laughs> it's your husband, it's Jerry, right? She only did have one husband, it was my fit, my. 
Uh, and over the years, they would have six children in all. She was a war bride. Larry was home for three weeks when they got married, and he was shipped off. And while he was away, their first child, Jen, was born. The children tell me they were busy beavers in many ways. Her children will, will tell you that she was also the quintessential mom. She was a room mother for elementary schools. Remember room mothers? I don't have them anymore, but I remember them. She uh, would go on field trips with the classrooms. She was also a den mother for uh, uh, Cub Scouts, if you remember that. In 1977, she was named as a volunteer of the year for the American Red Cross after serving decades in the blood donation services. And her favorite thing to do was to, to kind of encourage and to settle down those first times young people gave blood uh, to the Red Cross. She had, was a member of my church, Calvary Memorial, for many, many years. Uh, and she was involved in the food preparation for what we called then the King's Kitchen. Anyone here uh, an alumni of going to the King's Kitchen for, there you go, a few of you, a nice meal, um, some singing of those old gospel hymns, and excellent preaching, by the way, from the pastor and those, <laughs> those things. She loved to sing, and I was told she played the organ, which I did not know. I wish I would have known. I'd have had her playing for us in church. She had her own rendition, by the way, of Happy Birthday. Some of you who are laughing know what it is. And she would, I would get a phone call every year on my birthday. And without a word, that would start, Happy Birthday to you. I can't sing it to you because I don't remember how it goes, but she had her own rendition of it. There you go. She and Larry loved square dancing and traveled with uh, square dancing uh, groups around the, all over the place. They also were avid motorcyclists and spent many years and many miles, including a trip all the way out to Pikes Peak, Colorado, on their Honda Goldwing. They loved camping with their children and with their friends, especially on their property on the White River. Uh, the right, they were called the river rats, right, as they were known. Spent many seasons canoeing, camping, and enjoying the good campfire and the time around there. In fact, I had opportunity to stay on that property one time with one of my sons over the night. That was a lot of fun. During their retirement years, they weathered in central Florida, enjoying the company of their retired siblings and making many new friends in southern, parks, uh, southern Palms Park. Alma directed the water exercise class and was active in the church there in Florida. And after returning to Michigan, she lived in the Oaks Senior Community. She also was a, an ambassador for, for the Oaks. She was always involved helping and doing something there. She was facilitated the exercise classes. She called bingo twice a week. She was the one who was always greeting the new residents. She knew everybody's name, it seemed. And when I went to her birthday party, I think that was her 90th at the Oaks, right? There were so many people that knew her and loved her. Um, she loved playing cards, dominoes, cribbage, sewing, sticks. Um, she also looked after people as a whole there. She knew them all. So when I would go visit her, she would be talking about so-and-so, having a hard time with this or that, and what she was doing. She just seemed to know everybody's name, and she was a source of constant encouragement and laughter. In her younger years, she was also a member of the Girls Club. I remember the Girls Club. Well, believe it or not, I remember the Girls Club. My mom was a member of the Girls Club, whatever that was. I would show up after school. I kind of liked it because I would get there and there'd be all these card tables set up. And they were playing cards of some sort and eating food. And they had all this finger food that was in the kitchen, and I would always go in and sneak all the food that I could possibly, because it was the kind of sandwiches you just don't get every day. You know what I mean? So I enjoyed that. Her and Larry also were part of a couples club, because they met together. Um, she was also very proud of her children. She was proud of their successors, successes, but really how much you love each other. And you took care of your mom, 
And that always speaks well of the life of a mom. She laughed a lot, she loved deeply, she valued her friends. More than anything, Alma loved her Lord Jesus Christ and looked forward to her final home with him. She wanted everybody in her family to know that she expected to meet you there and she'd be waiting for you in heaven. She set an excellent example for, for, for you how to live. And in these last moments and months of her life, she also showed you how to die with faith and grace. On one of my visits to see her at Pompin House, she quoted Matthew chapter 11, 28, 29, and 30. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. She told me that the Lord Jesus was calling her home. And on Friday, June 18th, 2021, at the age of 96, she answered the call and she went home to Jesus. She is survived by five children, Janice Froelich of California, Jackie and Bruce McLean of Norton Shores, Lois and Larry Klinger of Muskegon, Jim and Laura. Jerry Klinger. Didn't I say that? Lois and Jerry Klinger of Muskegon, <laughs> Jim and Laura Fox of Spring Lake, and Larry Jr. and Joan Fox of Muskegon. Twelve grandchildren, 20 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren. Her brother Henry and Audrey Hendrickson. She was preceded by death uh, by her son Jake in 1949. Her husband Larry on January 29, 2006 her great-granddaughter Lillian Anderson in 2007, her sister, sister Anna Bartlett, Alan Taylor, and Carolyn Henderson, or Hendrickson, her brothers Lester, Chris, and Leonard Hendrickson, and son-in-law Jim Froelich. A devoted wife, loving mother, and grandmother, and sister, an enduring friend to all, and a faithful and persevering follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. She will be missed by us all. The earth is now poorer by her departure, but heaven is made richer by her arrival. Let us look to the scriptures to find grace and help in our time of need. I'll be reading from a few different portions, starting with John chapter 14. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Isaiah chapter 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even the youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Jesus said to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep so that you do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Romans tells us in chapter 8, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that arose from the dead, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered to be sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all things we are more than conquerors for him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we recognize that you are holy and that all that you do is pure and loving, wise and righteous. We desire, Lord, to honor your name today. And we pray that your kingdom will be present in the lives that are here, and powerfully so. And that our lives will reflect the complete obedience to your will as though we were actually living in heaven. We surrender, Lord, our wills to you. We want not our own. We pray for the strength needed for today, and by faith recognize that your mercies will be new tomorrow as well. I pray for Alma's family who are gathered here and who cannot be with us. Lord, give them your peace and soothe their sorrow for you are near to the brokenhearted. And the Lord Jesus is interceding for us even now. We thank you, Lord, for Alma, for how she lived and how she cared for others, for how she set an example of love and concern for others as the Lord Jesus did for us. We thank you for her faith and the assurance that we will see her again, she being with you in heaven. And I pray that we will take her legacy of love and faith and service and friendship with us and follow her example. As she was forgiving, may we also be. As she was separated from sin, may we also be. And as she lived by faith in Jesus, so shall we. Her life brought glory to you, and we ask that by your grace, ours will as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Bruce is going to play the guitar for us and sing a song. You're not? No. No guitar, but... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> this is uh, my mother-in-law's favorite hymn, uh, and she asked me to sing it, so we will. The 
Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the poor joy we share as we His voice It's so sweet The birds Hush their singing And the Melody That he gave To me Within My heart Is real Tells me I am his own And the joy we share As we tarry there None other has ever There's that McLean voice, I'll tell you. <laughs> a few of the family members and friends have just wanted to share some things about Alma, and we're going to do that at this time. We're going to start with Jennifer, then Sean, then Lindsay, and then Nathan. My glasses. Um, my grandma was one of my first friends. She taught me how to blow bubbles in my milk. She taught me how to stomp in the mud puddles, much to my mother's chagrin. She taught me how to play Clue and Cribbage, and she never let me win. I had to earn that, and I think all the grandchildren, you know, grandma never let you win. She tried to teach me how to crochet, but all I could manage was a really long chain. That's it. <laughs> so, and then I'd undo it and recrochet it. That's, that's what I could do. Um, when I was pregnant with Julie, who is now 12, um, I had asked, we were having um, a birthday dinner for my mom, and I asked my grandma if she wanted to be in the delivery room with me for that birth. And she was really excited because she had never gotten to see anybody that wasn't her own kids be born. That's not a good view anyways. So she was really, you know, looking forward to that. And so um, when I left, I was like, okay, grandma, um, I'm going in. I know it's like nine o'clock at night, but you can come. And she was like, oh, I don't want to do it in the middle of the night though. <laughs> I need to sleep. <laughs> it's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> but, that's not how it goes. So I told her that um, I would let her know in the morning um, how, you know, if, and if I was still in there, then, <laughs> then she could come in. And I was, and we called her, and she was at a doctor's appointment. <laughs> so, but she was in a doctor's appointment at, the, at Hackley, which is where I was giving birth. And so they told her, you know, <laughs> your granddaughter's up there if you want to get up there. So she finished her appointment. And as they were wheeling me from delivery into the room with this new tiny little red-headed squirmy baby who rolled over <laughs> in the nursery, um, I looked down the hallway and there she was. <laughs> Did I miss it? Did I miss it? Did I miss it? Did I miss it? I was like, well, you missed the delivery, but you get to be the first one to hold her. And she's like, oh, good, I'll take that. So she sat down, and she just scooped her up. And then um, 
she, while I was pregnant, she would come over every day because everybody else was working and I was sitting by myself and she kept me company, that whole thing. And then after the delivery, she came over every day and she would hold Julie and she would give me a chance to rest. And so I think Julie and, and Gigi have uh, quite the bond too. Um, so let's see. She came to every birthday party we ever had. Um, and we were talking about the birthday song that she always liked singing. We always would sing the traditional birthday song and she would always say, well, you know, <laughs> at, at the Oaks, we always sing it like this. And then she would start singing and we would all sing it along with her. Every, so, like five, 10 years of doing this, well, you know. And we would all sing it with her. So on her birthday, this last one, she came over and as we were bringing out her cake, Instead of the traditional song, we all started singing a happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And she looked around and her eyes got really big. And we all, and the best year you've ever had. And she goes, well, you guys finally learned it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Grandma, we finally learned it. <laughs> so um, Let's see, there are not a lot of people my age that get to have their grandmother as active in their life as mine has been. Um, and there are especially not a lot of great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren that get to see somebody like this as much as um, we have been able to. So we are incredibly blessed as the members of the Fox family to have had her in our life for so long. Um, the last time I saw her, I just had that feeling, you know. And so I sat next to her, I held her hand, I leaned my head on, on her shoulder, and she patted my face and she said, do you remember that time you snuck out to my mailbox on, on Sherman? I said, I remember, Grandma. She said, do you know why you remember that? Because I spanked you all the way back to the house. <laughs> yes, Grandma. <laughs> yes, that's, yes, you did. You spanked me all the way back to the house. Um, so she said, I just wanted to keep you safe and I wanted to make sure that you never tried it again. Um, I never doubted how much she loved me. And she's one of the nicest people I ever knew. She taught me how to play cards, maybe how to cheat at cards, because I can remember sitting there and we were playing phase 10 or something and she'd just be looking around. She's like, well, if nobody else is gonna go, I'll just take my turn. And it's like, it's not your turn. It is if I say so. <laughs> Okay, Grandma, <laughs> I guess it is. So I am, I am very happy that my grandma is finally at peace, that she has no more pain, that she is with the love of her life and her children, her child, and who she hasn't seen for 75 years, okay? Um, her son Jake and uh, her brothers and sisters that have gone on before her. And we will all miss her, but she is in a much better place, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Amen. Sean? Hi there. <laughs> so my dad texted me a couple of days ago and he said, do you want to say something at your grandmother's funeral? And I said, oh God, no. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to say. And then I thought about it and I have so many special memories of grandma and I, I know everyone else does too and I thought maybe it would be nice to share a couple. So um, when I was on Facebook a few days ago, I noticed that my cousins one by one were commenting about grandma and her cribbage, which is entirely true. <laughs> Grandma taught us all to play cards, cribbage, uh, something over the years, but she never let you win at anything. She would say, oh, you might have missed a point, and if you don't take it now, I will. <laughs> uh, I got really close, I think, a few times to beating her, only to have missed something, and she would say, oh, sorry you missed that, oh, but I pegged out. And if you play cribbage, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> Um, Grandma was incredibly kind, as so many people here 